Hi everyone, I'm Abigail, this is James, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. We are joined today by United States Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Congresswoman Schakowsky has served the United States Congress longer than any woman in the history of Illinois. Congressman, woman, thank you for being with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be with you today. And I appreciate what you're doing. So ask me the questions that you want. We really appreciate it. Why did you become a Congresswoman? So, you know, I am interested in a lot of issues like I would like to see in the United States of America that health care was available for anyone who needed it or wanted it. That it wasn't just a question of money or even where you live, but that we, like most other big countries around the world that are successful, provide health care for the people who live there. And that's really what got me started, was the issue of health care for all. We are 10 years old and most politics seem mean. And ugly. The decisions made impact our future. Should we care about politics yet, or should we just be kids? So let me tell you something. I used to say to people your age, so what do you want to do when you grow up? I never say that anymore. What I say now is, what are you doing now? Your voices are very, very important. And I'll give you a couple of issues that I think the voice of young people really means a lot. One is the environment. Let's face it, this is your century way more than it's my century. You're gonna be living a long time after I'm not. And therefore, I think your voice saying that we have to address global warming. We have to make sure that the planet is livable for me, for my children, for my grandchildren, that's your voice. And so I think speaking out, what do I mean by that? Um, in school, to uh, people like me, um, maybe letters to the editor, how about videos, talking about the importance of addressing a clean environment. That's one. Number two, guns. You know, that num in the United States of America, the number one killer of children is gun violence. Not a disease, not car accidents, gun violence. We're the only country, really, in the world that has so many guns, more guns than people in the United States. And we have to do something to make access to guns less available, especially things like assault weapons. These are weapons of war. They don't belong in the hands of people. But even the so-called everyday shootings that are happening in our communities, we have to pass laws, we have to make regulations that prevent the easy access of guns. That's something that young people, because I know a lot of young people are saying, I'm afraid at school. I don't want to have to go through those drills and you know, what if there's an active shooter? I want to feel safe at school. And I know parents want to feel that way too about their children. But your voices, that we need to have gun legislation, gun safety legislation. And that's why I say, you know, not what are you going to do when you grow up? Can you speak out especially about guns and the environment? How would you recommend talking to people with views completely different than your own? Well, you know, in some ways I feel like um, we have to start by talking to people who agree with us and ask them to get more and more involved. But it's a good question to say, how do you talk to people that don't agree with you. And I, that happens to me in the Congress a lot. And you know, the more we can have these calm con conversations, why do you think that way? Is there any common ground that we can find? Can we work together 
on certain things over here and maybe not on over over there. Um, and so, especially in the Congress when we have um, Democrats, I'm one of them, and Republicans who now have the majority in the House of Representatives, as much as possible, I think we just need to be calm, respectful, and try and have as many of those conversations as possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes, you know, it's my way or the highway, they say. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna deal with you, I don't wanna, okay, then we move on. But as much as possible, and I get along with a lot of my Republicans, um, and we get things done because we talk to each other. It seems to us that people's identities are wrapped in their political beliefs. Has it always been that way? You know, I have been in Congress almost, I'm in my 28th year, long before you were born. And I served in Republican, under Republican presidents and under Democratic presidents. And for example, President George W. Bush, a Republican. When he was president, we got a lot of things done anyway. Certainly I disagreed with him on things like the war in Iraq, but, but, but we got things done because the definition of being a member of Congress was, you can disagree, but at the end of the day, you try and reach for compromise. And so, we were able to compromise and get a lot of things done, like I passed a very important bill to make children's toys and products safer. And we had bipartisan support. Then along came a group called the Tea Party. It was right around the Barack Obama administration. And some of the Republicans said, no, I don't believe in compromise. Compromise is a dirty word. We want things the way we want them, and we're not going to agree. So what has happened, and especially during the Donald Trump administration, people have become what we say polarized. You're either you know, the, uh, uh, supporter of Donald Trump, or you're not, and, um, and it's been much more difficult to reach compromise because people become polarized and in their corner and identify themselves with a certain ideology, a certain set of beliefs. And I think that's really unfortunate. Can you give us a recent example to give us hope about how our government works? Okay, I'd be happy to do that. So it took 30 years to finally get some anti-gun violence legislation passed. Passed with the help in the Congress of Republicans and Democrats. But I think the reason we were able to make progress is really because a lot of people have been speaking up. So the voices of ordinary people have helped to change the politics of guns. Victories, even if they're small, give people hope that we can go forward and do more. And that's why it was important for us to pass some uh, bipartisan, Republicans and Democrats, legislation to limit gun violence. How has politics changed since you first joined under con in Congress under President Clinton? Well, that's what, I, that's what I was saying before. I've been there through um, the, uh, the um, I, it was just at the end of the Clinton administration, but I was there through all of the Republican George W. Bush administration, and it was just a much friendlier environment to talk across the aisle, to get some things done, even though we disagreed. How do you think schools should teach politics? Well, first of all, I do think schools should teach politics. I don't mean just politics, but even just history. 
because right now there are some states like in Florida where they don't want to even teach about discrimination, um, about um, the Holocaust, uh, about the Civil War, about slavery. I think what's important um, isn't so much in a political way, but to teach people this is what happened. For example, when you talk about slavery, there were millions of people who were living in what was called the United States of America, which was the United States of America, who were enslaved, who didn't have any voting power, who didn't have any decision-making power. They um, basically were on the same level of um, animals. And, and so, fortunately, we were able to end that war, to end it through a civil war in this country, and to pass laws that gave people the rights, the rights of, um, for example, of um, same-sex marriage. It was decided by the Supreme Court, and you couldn't have discrimination, to make sure that everyone um, except women, at one point, had voting rights, regardless of their race. And then, in 1920s, we passed the law that said women had the right to vote. At every step of the way, until recently, the, uh, the United States Supreme Court has added power to the people. I want to see even further rights um, and that, that, that those rights should be taught. Those discussions should be had. The truth, the facts should be told and taught in schools. If we ever want to end anti-Semitism and all the other antis in the world, we need just to study about it. What do you so, think kids our age should know about the 2024 election? Should we participate, and if so, how? Okay, that's <laughs> such an important question. Yes and yes. I think um, students can participate in elections. Um, guess what? Everybody, I don't know if you have uh, phones yourselves, but anyone can make phone calls, and you could say, um, I'm a uh, young person um, that is interested in this election, and I hope that you will um, vote for someone who will end gun violence and protect the environment. You can um, knock on the doors of your neighbors. You can put out a sign. You don't have to be 18 years old and eligible to vote to participate in elections. If you could get one piece of legislation passed, what would it be? Well, I guess I would, um, I would vote for universal access to health care. That, that would be a good start, I think. Um, that would be something I would want to not have anybody worry about. A close second would be I want to make it a right to have um, access to quality, healthy food for every single person on the table. How do we make social media better for kids and better for the country? Well, you know, we, I, I actually, that's a committee that I'm on, um, would be to control big tech. We have lots of rules that would protect children from advertisers, from false information, from um, trying to have direct contact with you in inappropriate ways. We can pass laws that protect children online. We want to make sure that the law also says wherever children are online, in schools, in the community, online, on your own devices, that we are gonna make sure that there is no exploitation of kids. What advice would you have for somebody who may want to become a congressperson? Be involved. 
be involved in um, issues, um, in um, campaigns, be a leader, learn to be a leader, which I see both of you are. Um, and by that, I mean have followers. That's kind of, for me, the definition of being a leader is that you are helping to organize people to do something um, and uh, that you're uh, promoting an issue, that you are speaking out on a, a, an issue at school or in your community or online or in the newspaper that you think is important. So um, people get to know who you are. They um, get to admire what you do to follow you as a leader. Um, and there's no uh, too early time to start to, to do that. Finally, it's time for our Turbo 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I don't know. I'll do my best. <laughs> Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? My favorite phrase that I use at um, rallies and meetings is, when we fight, we win. Number two, what is one subject you'd love to learn more about? Technology. I'm not really great at it. I fortunately have, uh, ha have help, but because I am on committees that deal with technology, uh, like artificial intelligence, for instance. I think it's really important. It's the thing of the future. I think there's things to worry about and things that are great opportunities. But I need to follow that, especially if I want to do my work in my committee that deals with this. Number three, what was your favorite food growing up? My, now, I want to tell you this. For the last year and a half, and going forward, I've been a vegetarian. So that has really, really changed things. But I'll tell you this. I have one moment of indulgence every week. On the weekends, and this goes back um, I will have lox and bagels. Lox is not vegetarian. But um, I've always really, really loved that as a favorite thing, starting from being a pretty little kid. What, what is your favorite type of cheese? I would have to say, wow, I'm a, I am a cheese lover. I like cheddar, I think I'm gonna pick. Cheddar cheese. Number five, what is your favorite movie quote? My favorite movie quote is an old movie, Nobody Puts Baby in the Corner. That's a movie called, maybe not a movie yet, even now, ready for you, Dirty Dancing. Anyway, it's about your, don't put down this woman. Don't tell her what to do. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh, I guess Wonder Woman. That's, again, that's probably old fashioned already. But, uh, you know, having superpowers as uh, Wonder Woman would be awesome. Doing even more, especially physically. Number seven. If you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? My family, my mother's side of the family came to the United States, was from Ukraine, but Ukraine at the time was um, Russia. I would, that's a place in the world. I've been ha able, as a member of Congress especially, to visit a lot of places around the world, but not this place where I have my heritage. It is not possible right now, as soon as I could, to go to that place and maybe I could even find some information about where my family actually lived. Number eight, what is your favorite rainy day activity? Well, I love my dogs, uh, I have to tell you, I really do. And um, just, you know, if we're indoors especially, um, I would just 
you know, love to stay indoors with my dog. Number nine. If you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Um, I definitely um, would love to just sit down and have dinner with President Joe Biden. Um, he is a friend. I met with him yesterday, in fact, because when he was in was in Chicago. But just you know what I mean, a kind of a, a casual dinner with uh, Joe Biden, maybe Joe and uh, and his wife. That would be nice. If my husband and I could have with them. Number ten. What What's the best piece of of advice you were ever given? Nancy Pelosi, who was the who was the Speaker of the House, she actually wrote a book with this title that was Know Your Power. You know, and I believe that one of the things that is, you know, people who don't have self-confidence, who don't believe in their own power, that that's a real shame. And what she is really saying is that everyone has within them a power to be effective to make a difference. And so I think that was that's the best advice to everyone. Focus on your strengths. Know your power. Use your power. So the phrase is know your power. Best advice. You did great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for doing that. Can we shake? And can we shake? And Congresswoman Schakowsky, thank you for spending time with us today. But I just love this. I admire you. I feel when I hear from you just such optimism about the world, honestly, because young people like you, you're already making a difference. So thank you. Thank you for having me.